Noah's Ark Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, Tevet Noah is the vessel in the Genesis flood narrative Genesis chapters 6 through which God spares Noah, his family, and examples of all the world's animals from a world-engulfing flood. The story in Genesis is repeated, with variations, in the Quran, where the Ark appears as Safina Nu Arabic, Noah's boat. Searches for Noah's Ark have been made from at least the time of Eusebius c. 275–339 CE, and believers in the Ark continue to search for it in modern times. Many searches have been mounted for the Ark, but no confirmable physical proof of the Ark has ever been found. There is no scientific evidence that Noah's Ark existed as it is described in the Bible, nor is there evidence in the geologic record for the biblical global flood. <laughs> Description The structure of the Ark and the chronology of the flood are homologous with the Jewish temple and with temple worship. Accordingly, Noah's instructions are given to him by God Genesis chapter 6 verses 14 to 16, the Ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. These dimensions are based on a numerological preoccupation with the number 60, the same number characterizing the vessel of the Babylonian flood hero. Its three internal divisions reflect the three-part universe imagined by the ancient Israelites, heaven, the earth, and the underworld. Each deck is the same height as the temple in Jerusalem, itself a microcosmic model of the universe, and each is three times the area of the court of the tabernacle, leading to the suggestion that the author saw both ark and tabernacle as serving for the preservation of human life. It has a door in the side, and a soha, which may be either a roof or a skylight. It is to be made of gopher wood a word which appears nowhere else in the Bible, and divided into kinam, a word which always refers to birds' nests elsewhere in the Bible, leading some scholars to amend this to kanam, reads. The finished vessel is to be smeared with copper, meaning pitch or bitumen, in Hebrew the two words are closely related, kapata, smeared. Backhopper. Topic Origins. Topic Mesopotamian precursors. For well over a century scholars have recognized that the Bible's story of Noah's Ark is based on older Mesopotamian models. Because all these flood stories deal with events that allegedly happened at the dawn of history, they give the impression that the myths themselves must come from very primitive origins, but the myth of the global flood that destroys all life only begins to appear in the Old Babylonian period 20th, 16th centuries BCE. The reasons for this emergence of the typical Mesopotamian flood myth may have been bound up with the specific circumstances of the end of the Third Dynasty of Yore around 2004 BCE and the restoration of order by the First Dynasty of Isin. There are nine known versions of the Mesopotamian flood story, each more or less adapted from an earlier version. In the oldest version, inscribed in the Sumerian city of Nippur c.1600 BCE, the hero is King Ziasudra. This is known as the Sumerian flood story and probably derives from an earlier version. The Ziasudra version tells how he builds a boat and rescues life when the gods decide to destroy it. This remains the basic plot for several subsequent flood stories and heroes, including Noah. Ziasudra's Sumerian name means, he of long life. In Babylonian versions his name is Atreusis, but the meaning is the same. In the Atreusis version, the flood is a river flood, the version closest to the biblical story of Noah, as well as its most likely source, is that of Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The most complete text of Utnapishtim's story is a clay tablet dating from the 7th century BCE, but fragments of the story have been found from as far back as the 19th century BCE. 
The last known version of the Mesopotamian flood story was written in Greek in the 3rd century BCE by a Babylonian priest named Berossus. From the fragments that survive, it seems little changed from the versions of 2,000 years before. The parallels between Noah's Ark and the arcs of Babylonian flood heroes Atreusus and Utnapishtim have often been noted. Atrahasa's ark was circular, resembling an enormous kuffer, and had one or two decks. Utnapishtim's ark was a cube and had six decks with seven compartments on each, each divided into nine subcompartments for 63 subcompartments per deck and 378 total. Noah's ark was rectangular and had three decks. There is believed to be a linear progression from circular to cubic or square to rectangular. The most striking similarity is the near identical deck areas of the three arcs 14,400 cubits 2, 14,400 cubits 2, and 15,000 cubits 2 for Atrahasas, Utnapishtims, and Noah's Ark, respectively, a difference of 4%. This has led Professor Finkel to conclude that the iconic story of the Flood, Noah, and the Ark as we know it today certainly originated in the landscape of ancient Mesopotamia, modern Iraq." Linguistic parallels between Noah's Ark and the Ark of the Babylonian Flood hero Atreusus have also been noted. The word used for pitch Ceiling tar or resin in Genesis is not the normal Hebrew word, but is closely related to the word used in the Babylonian story. Likewise, the Hebrew word for ark teva is nearly identical to the Babylonian word for an oblong boat tubu, especially given that v and b are the same letter in Hebrew bet. However, the causes for God, God's having sent the flood differ. In the Hebrew myth the flood comes as God's judgment on a wicked humanity. In the Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh, the reasons are not given and the flood appears to be the result of the caprice of the gods. In the Atreusus version of the Babylonian flood story, the flood was sent by the gods to reduce human overpopulation, and after the flood, other measures were introduced to prevent the problem recurring. Composition There is consensus among scholars that the Torah the first five books of the Bible, beginning with Genesis was the product of a long and complex process that was not completed until after the Babylonian exile. Biblical scholar Richard Friedman suggests that the flood narrative was composed by the combination of two versions of the story, characterized by different names for God one story uses, God, one, Yahweh. In later works Topic. Rabbinic Judaism The story of the flood closely parallels the story of the creation, a cycle of creation, uncreation, and recreation, in which the ark plays a pivotal role. The universe as conceived by the ancient Hebrews comprised a flat disc-shaped habitable earth with the heavens above and Sheol, the underworld of the dead, below. These three were surrounded by a watery ocean of chaos, protected by the firmament, a transparent but solid dome resting on the mountains which ringed the earth. Noah's three-deck ark represents this three-level Hebrew cosmos in miniature, the heavens, the earth, and the waters beneath. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the three-level world as a space in the midst of the waters for humanity. In Genesis chapters 6 to 8, the flood narrative, he fills that space with waters again, saving only Noah, his family and the animals with him in the ark. Talmudic tractates Sanhedrin, Avodah Zarah and Zevahim relate that while Noah was building the ark, he attempted to warn his neighbors of the coming deluge, but was ignored or mocked. In order to protect Noah and his family, God placed lions and other ferocious animals to guard them from the wicked who tried to stop them from entering the ark. According to one midrash, it was God, or the angels, who gathered the animals to the ark, together with their food. 
as there had been no need to distinguish between clean and unclean animals before this time, the clean animals made themselves known by kneeling before Noah as they entered the ark. A differing opinion said that the ark itself distinguished clean animals from unclean, admitting seven pairs each of the former and one pair each of the latter. According to Sanhedrin 108b, Noah was engaged both day and night in feeding and caring for the animals, and did not sleep for the entire year aboard the ark. The animals were the best of the species, and so behaved with utmost goodness. They abstained from procreation, so that the number of creatures that disembarked was exactly equal to the number that embarked. The raven created problems, refusing to leave the ark when Noah sent it forth and accusing the patriarch of wishing to destroy its race, but as the commentators pointed out, God wished to save the raven, for its descendants were destined to feed the prophet Elijah. According to one tradition, refuse was stored on the lowest of the ark's three decks, humans and clean beasts on the second, and the unclean animals and birds on the top. A differing interpretation described the refuse as being stored on on the utmost deck, from where it was shoveled into the sea through a trapdoor. Precious stones, said to be as bright as the noon sun, provided light, and God ensured that food remained fresh. Some more unorthodox interpretations of the Ark narrative also surface. The 12th century Jewish commentator Abraham ibn Ezra interpreted the Ark as being a vessel that remained underwater for 40 days, after which it floated to the surface. Christianity Interpretations of the Ark narrative played an important role in early Christian doctrine. The first epistle of Peter composed around the end of the 1st century AD compared Noah's salvation through water to salvation through water in baptism, 1 Pt 320-21 Street. Hippolytus of Rome died 235 sought to demonstrate that the ark was a symbol of the Christ who was expected stating that the vessel had its door on the east side the direction from which Christ would appear at the second coming and that the bones of Adam were brought aboard together with gold frankincense and myrrh the symbols of the nativity of Christ Hippolytus furthermore stated that the ark floated to and fro in the four directions on the waters making the sign of the cross before eventually landing on Mount Cardu in the east in the land of the sons of Raban and the orientals call it Mount Godash the armenians call it Ararat on a more practical plane, Hippolytus explained that the lowest of the three decks was for wild beasts, the middle for birds and domestic animals, and the top level for humans. He says that male animals were separated from the females by sharp stakes so that there would be no breeding on board. The early church father and theologian Oregon, c. 182-251, in response to a critic who doubted that the ark could contain all the animals in the world, argued that Moses, the traditional author of the book of Genesis, had been brought up in Egypt and would therefore have used the larger Egyptian cubit. He also fixed the shape of the ark as a truncated pyramid, square at its base, and tapering to a square peak one cubit on a side. It was not until the 12th century that it came to be thought of as a rectangular box with a sloping roof. Early Christian artists depicted Noah standing in a small box on the waves, symbolizing God saving the Christian church in its turbulent early years. Saint Augustine of Hippo 354 to 430 in his work City of God demonstrated that the dimensions of the ark corresponded to the dimensions of the human body which according to Christian doctrine is the body of Christ and in turn the body of the church Saint Jerome C 347 to 420 identified the raven which was sent forth and did not return as the foul bird of wickedness Expelled by baptism, more enduringly, the dove and olive branch came to symbolize the Holy Spirit and the hope of salvation and eventually, peace. The olive branch remains a secular and religious symbol of peace today. The Quran and later Muslim works 
in contrast to the Jewish tradition, which uses a term that can be translated as a box or chest. To describe the Ark, Surah 29-15 of the Quran refers to it as a safina, an ordinary ship, and Surah 54-13 describes the Ark as a thing of boards and nails. Abd Allah ibn Abbas, a contemporary of Muhammad, wrote that Noah was in doubt as to what shape to make the Ark, and that Allah revealed to him that it was to be shaped like a bird's belly and fashioned of teak wood. Abdullah ibn Umar al Baidawi, writing in the 13th century, explains that in the first of its three levels, wild and domesticated animals were lodged, in the second, the human beings, and in the third, the birds. On every plank was the name of a prophet. Three missing planks, symbolizing three prophets, were brought from Egypt by Og, son of Anak, the only one of the giants permitted to survive the flood. The body of Adam was carried in the middle to divide the men from the women. Surah 1141 says, And he said, Ride ye in it, in the name of Allah it moves and stays. This was taken to mean that Noah said, In the name of Allah when he wished the ark to move, and the same when he wished it to stand still. The medieval scholar Abu al Hasan Ali ibn al Hussein Masudi wrote that Allah commanded the earth to absorb the water, and certain portions which were slow in obeying received salt water in punishment and so became dry and arid. The water which was not absorbed formed the seas, so that the waters of the flood still exist. Masudi says that the Ark began its voyage at Kufa in central Iraq and sailed to Mecca, circling the Kaaba before finally traveling to Mount Judi, which Surah 1144 states was its final resting place. This mountain is identified by tradition with a hill near the town of Jazirat ibn Umar on the east bank of the Tigris in the province of Mosul in northern Iraq, and Masudi says that the spot could be seen in his time. Ba'a'i The Ba'a'i faith regards the Ark and the Flood as symbolic. In Ba'a'i belief, only Noah's followers were spiritually alive, preserved in the Ark of his teachings, as others were spiritually dead. The Ba'a'i scripture Kitab i Ikan endorses the Islamic belief that Noah had numerous companions on the ark, either 40 or 72, as well as his family, and that he taught for 950 symbolic years before the flood. The Ba'a'i faith was founded in 19th century Persia, and it recognizes divine messengers from both the Abrahamic and the Indian traditions. Historicity While research shows a literal Noah's Ark did not exist, nor is there geologic evidence of a biblical global flood, believers throughout history have tried to rationalize the Ark's existence. The first edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica from 1771 describes the Ark's existence as fact. It also attempts to explain how the Ark could house all living animal types. Buteo and Kircher have proved geometrically, that, taking the common cubit as a foot and a half, the Ark was abundantly sufficient for all the animals supposed to be lodged in it. The number of species of animals will be found much less than is generally imagined, not amounting to a hundred species of quadrupeds." It also endorses a supernatural explanation for the flood, stating that Many attempts have been made to account for the deluge by means of natural causes, but these attempts have only tended to discredit philosophy, and to render their authors ridiculous. The 1860 edition attempts to solve the problem of the Ark being unable to house all animal types by suggesting a local flood, which is described in the 1910 edition as part of a "...gradual surrender of attempts to square scientific facts with a literal interpretation of the Bible," that resulted in "...the higher criticism and the rise of the modern scientific views as to the origin of species." leading to 
scientific comparative mythology being the frame in which Noah's Ark was interpreted by 1875. Topic: <laughs> Ark's geometry. In Europe, the Renaissance saw much speculation on the nature of the Ark that might have seemed familiar to early theologians such as Origen and Augustine. At the same time, however, a new class of scholarship arose, one which, while never questioning the literal truth of the Ark story, began to speculate on the practical workings of Noah's vessel from within a purely naturalistic framework. In the 15th century, Alfonso Tostada gave a detailed account of the logistics of the Ark, down to arrangements for the disposal of dung and the circulation of fresh air. The 16th century geometer Johannes Butteo calculated the ship's internal dimensions, allowing room for Noah's grinding mills and smokeless ovens, a model widely adopted by other commentators. <laughs> <laughs> Searches for Noah's Ark Searches for Noah's Ark have been made from at least the time of Eusebius c. To, CE to the present day. Today, the practice is widely regarded as pseudoarchaeology. Various locations for the Ark have been suggested but have never been confirmed. Search sites have included Durapina site, a site on Mount Tenduric in eastern Turkey and Mount Ararat, but geological investigation of possible remains of the Ark has only shown natural sedimentary formations. See also Biblical literalism Black Sea Deluge Hypothesis Book of Noah Dwevan and Dwevak Gilgamesh flood myth List of longest wooden ships List of topics characterized as pseudoscience Manu Hinduism Noah's Ark replicas and derivatives Sons of Noah Sumerian flood myth Talkarijan's archive Wives aboard Noah's Ark Zia Sudra equals equals notes. <laughs>